Bless the Lord, everybody. Bless the Lord, everybody. Thank you, Miss Brittany. Thank you, thank you, Miss Michelle. Thank you. We love you. God bless you. I'm ready. No, no, no. I'm ready, but I don't know if you're ready or not, because I feel like you've forgotten that silence is the language of defeat. So unless you're defeated, you better get to shout. No, I don't want that religious shout. I want that ruah. Yeah, I want the whole thing. I want that I'm not going to hold anything back. I want that I don't care what the devil attempted. That devil is defeated. Kind of praise. I need a hand wave. I need a hand clap. I need a leaper. I need a jumper. I need a dancer. And under God, it's October. We better have some spinners. Because spinning is the language of authority. Look at you standing there looking at me. I said, I need some spinners. And I'm not talking about that kind. Just turn around, man. Turn around. Let the devil know he doesn't have you. Can't have your mind. Can't have your emotions. Can't have your physical bondage. Can't have your future. Denied access into your present. If you know he's defeated, I want you to give the God of all creation glory that's worthy of his name. All right. Uh, changed my plans. Got a little book for you. Actually, I have two books for you. I don't know why I only have one up here. That's it. James liked that because it matched his shirt. This one's called Divine Encounter, celebrating God's calendar, celestial clues, and the culmination watch of creation. Of creation. Say it. The culmination of creation. You have no idea how many worlds God created. You see, I've already got your attention. There are unborn ages, new creations at this moment proceeding out of the being of God. The Bible is just our window into God's determined dealings with humanity. That's all. The problem with humanity is they've reduced God so small that they put him in a body. This is what they know about it. They put him in a body, right? They didn't know anything for 30 years. But then for three and a half years, they witnessed him. John 1, 1 said, in the beginning was the word, but not in the beginning of all things. Read your Bible. Don't just read your Bible. In the beginning of all things. He's only dealing with all things that pertain to you, to life, and to godliness. He's not dealing with who he is, what he is. Okay, I'm already getting started. You've, I've already got you with your lower chin drop down. Do you think that God stopped creating when he created Adam and Eve? Do you think he stopped creating when he spun the worlds into being? Do you think that all there is to God is things like Job said in the beginning, he hung the earth on nothing? How do you hang something on nothing? First of all, how do you get something from nothing? The word create is the word bara. 
it is not the word to assemble from dismantled parts. It is to create from nothing. What do you think you're going to do in heaven? Now, I don't know about you. I don't want a cabin in the corner of glory land. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. I said, I don't want a cabin in the corner of glory land. If he promised me a mansion, I'm about to have a mansion. And it's not going to be in the corner. It's going to be on Hallelujah Boulevard and Glory Avenue. Yeah. So what you going to do when you get there? We don't understand anything about the spirit realm. Dr. Lowe, they don't, they're so earthly minded, don't even ever even think about heaven. When if you took, if you took a rope and wrapped it all around this building and that recognized, and that represented your existence, there would be about this much of it that deals with your life on this earth. So why are you so interested in it and so disinterested in heaven? This life is like a vapor, <laughs> seen, then gone. Believe you me, when you get to 62, you wonder where 61 of them went. <laughs> this thing will be over before you know it. For every single one of us, and barring the rapture, ain't none of y'all getting off this planet alive. And then eternity. So what you gonna do in heaven? Old folk, you saying, I'm just gonna have me a, man, a cabin in the corner of glory land. Oh Lord, they'd get up to sing, they'd say, oh Lord, help me. I'm not much of a singer, sit down then. Don't pay attention to the way I sang it. We can't help it. You've been off pitch since you started. Just pay attention to the words. We can't understand them. That's, that's the kind of stuff they used to say, you know. And everybody go, whoa! What are we talking about? They used to say, well, I'm gonna go over, dip my feet in Jordan. Why? They won't be tired. I can tell you what you're going to do. You're going to rule, according to that book, over nations and over kingdoms. And he's not talking about the ones on this planet. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Wonder what that thing's going to be like. Maybe you be like angels, traveling, not at the speed of light. I've heard preachers preach, angels travel at the speed of light. No, they don't. They travel at the speed of thought. God travels faster than the speed of thought. How do I know that? Because I can read. Before you get my name out your mouth, I will be found with you. Let me tell you why. Because he didn't have to come from nowhere. Some folks say, oh, I can feel him. He's here. He's always. Now, true enough, you may be, you may be getting better at moving in and recognizing his presence, but he ain't gone nowhere, nor is he going anywhere. He said he would be with you to the end. He said he'd be with you in the hell you went through today and in the heaven you're about to experience tonight. I wish I had half a church start to shout because I'm preaching about a God that's bigger than you conceived, bigger than you perceived, and he's bigger than your faith to believe. Be seated.
Your faith came from him. What? Every morning I get up, I receive Holy Communion. Get a $10 bill in your palm if you don't have these two books. Divine Encounter and the Sukkot Mystery Revealed. The Sukkot Mystery Revealed. If you don't have those, you can have them both right now for $10. If you don't have one, you can give by just putting it on your phone. Just put it on your phone. They're normally $20, they're half price. Everybody's already got them. Everybody's already got them. All right, there are just a few left. I think this is the third week we've been on this, so wouldn't be many of you that don't have it. We're going to pay particular attention to this little book called The Sukkot Mystery Revealed. Are you with me? Are you with me? Do you have a Bible? Open it up to the book of Romans. The book of Romans. Written to the Italians, of course. You're not even here tonight. The book of Romans. And we're going to look at chapter 12. Chapter 12. And we'll begin at the beginning in verse 1. Now, if you open your little book, you can turn over there to page number one. And, and at the very beginning, what I'm sharing with you is that one of the most consistent redemptive themes, you understand redemption? To purchase back by paying the sacrificial price. If I was you and I had a book, I'd circle the word revelation or, or I'd circle the word redemption and that's what I'd write beside it because that's what Jesus did for you. He paid the sacrificial price to purchase you back. In other words, you had belonged to him, but something happened between Genesis 1-1, Genesis 1-2, and man lost fellowship and communion and connection with God. In other words, he got unplugged. So human beings, as they're walking around the earth today, are living dead men because they are disconnected from the source of life. You with me so far? All right. So what I wrote here is throughout the Bible, the recurring theme is that God, now this is staggering to me. When you think about what I've shared with you about God over the last four weeks, and then I come in here tonight and tell you that it has always been God's major theme to be connected to you to dwell among his people. Now you think of this. This is why God created Imagio Dei, Genesis 1, 26, 27. God formed a man of the dust of the ground, breathed, say breathed, say breath, say ruah, say God is that spirit. God is not confined to a body. God is not confined to a locality. God is not confined to a people. God is not confined to time. God is not confined to space. That's the God I'm talking to you about. yod heh wah -He. Get it up there. I can tell by the way they're looking at me. yod heh wah -He. Not that. I told you to get that 20 minutes ago. I've been in four other scriptures since then. Say yod heh wah -He. Say the word hey. Those are commonly before Josephus, the great, great, great Jewish historian. Those four letters, we would call them consonants. But Josephus taught us that in the original Hebrew language, they actually were not consonants, but they were present progressive tense vowels. 
You say, why does that matter? Because a consonant has no movement. That's the reason the ancient Jews would not even pronounce the name of God. That's why his name was described through those four characters. Are you with me? They are what? Yod or Yod, doesn't matter. Say it again. Say it again. Some folks say Vahe, and that's okay. It's just a later translation. Is that all right? So if we're going all the way back to the back to the back, we find yod he wah And those are, in your vernacular, those would be what? Verbs, not consonants, verbs. Josephus taught us that. As verbs, they are similar to your verbs. Or, so tell me your verbs. Look, look at that, look at that. A Marine over there shouting them out. So everybody shout them out like a Marine would shout them out in front of a drill sergeant. Surely you've learned this. Say it again. People get on my nerves and say sometimes why. Because I'm like an all out guy. I'm, I'm in it for the long haul, amen? So yod he wah he, similar to A-E-I-O-U. Going to ask you now, when you say your vows, does your tongue touch the roof of your mouth, as in a T? Do your lips come together, as in an M? Why? Those are consonants. In order to be a vowel, it's a guttural sound meaning it is unhindered or unobstructed from the very depths of a man. It is a breath. When you say A, all you're doing is giving sound to your air, to your breath. You, you with me? And so when God said he breathed into man the breath of life, he was actually conjuring, if you will, in the best sense of the word, as he told Ezekiel, prophesy to the wind. He actually told him, prophesy to the four winds, because there are four breaths that represent Yahweh, yod he wah they are on the board behind you. yod he wah So when God changed Abram's name and revealed himself to Abram as El Shaddai, not just Jehovah, not just Yahweh, he said, I'm going to give you a new revelation, Abram, of who I am. And the Bible said he changed his name to Abram. <laughs> identifying him with himself and as El Shaddai I'm moving quickly he was the God who reserved the right to alter or reverse or otherwise manipulate any law he had created now in the world <laughs> Now, in the world you and I live in, philosophers, naturalists, uh, uh, those who believe in situational ethics and the like, the scientific world and the world of academia, of which everything else is held in bondage, especially the Church of Jesus Christ takes a back seat as science tries to portray intellectual superiority over us so we don't speak out, we back up. But God didn't put my voice back in me to play with it. I know in whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep everything I've committed to him against that day. Say, yod hey wah hey is my God. All right, be seated. 
Now your Bible says there in Genesis 1, before I get to Romans 12, in Genesis 1, in the beginning God created. Shout that word. This is also one of the Hebrew names of God. His name is Jehovah, Yahweh, yad heh wah bara Everybody say bara. Now, you'll, don't get nervous. I'm, I didn't say Barak. I said bara. Bara is one of the two words for creation or to create. Are you with me? All right, so when God created, watch me, when God created, he did not create from the first kind or the first word that is not bara. He created from the second word, which is bara. The first word is to put back together that which was dismantled. But God is not about ready to use the leftovers. I don't have nobody in here right now. I said God is not about ready to use the leftovers. He'll put a brand new heart in you in fact he said he would when you got born again and here's where we're missing it in the modern church where we're just trying to make a decision and then try to be better that's not what God said he said I will reach down inside you and I will pull out a stony heart a stony spirit which is alive but abiding in death you're not following me and I will give you a heart of flesh to serve me so he's talking about redemption he's talking about returning you to the original state of affairs not only Say, I have a recreated spirit. But that does not mean the old one made over. That's not how God creates. When he created the heavens and the earth and all that in them is, he created it, them, us, from nothing so when he talks about redeeming you talking about paying the sacrificial price to return you to the original state of affairs that is a man walking in the earth as Adam did Stop acting like what Adam did, the first Adam, was greater than what the second Adam, Jesus, did. Jesus came to restore, renew, replenish, refresh everything in the natural realm concerning your life. Spirit, soul, and body. But God always starts from the inside and works out. So the first thing he's going to do is give you a new spirit. Here's how he does it. Here's how he does it. I'm six foot two inches tall. If I sit down there beside you, I'm shorter than Michelle. Because all of my height is in my legs. It's three feet from right there to down yonder. You understand? I got that from my mother. This nose I got from my father. My mother possessed an egg. My daddy possess a whole lot of swimmers. (laughs) 
You ought to just shout. I'm the swimmer that made it. All those others got, they died along the way. Missed the mark. But you, you winner. You, you overcomer. You, you fighter. You, you God ordained to walk the earth person. You made it. Can I have a drink of water? Three bottle night. We all together now? Okay. So God, God created you in his image. Imagine your day. I can't go there again. No, I can't. Give me my box. How many dimensions? Three. Dear Lord, some of you know. You live in a three-dimensional world. There ain't nothing in it four-dimensional. That's the reason a demon spirit has to possess a body. How many dimensions? Three. When God created you, imagine your day, he created you from the dust of the ground, breathed into your nostrils, number two, number three, and you became a living soul. So you are a three-dimensional person. I don't even want to get into the three dimensions of your spirit, the three dimensions of your mind, and the three dimensions of your body. The easiest one for you to understand are the three dimensions of your body. You have height, you have width, and you have depth. You don't have anything else, right? So when God created you, he being the light, if I shine the light through this box, only two dimensions would be reflected. Meaning one dimension disappears. So when God created you in his image, he gave you three dimensions because you were going to live in a three-dimensional world. But the same as three reflects two, right? Three reflects as two. So human beings reflect as three in a three-dimensional world. But if God was only three dimensions, then you would be God. So in that process, God is showing you that you are not him, that you are in desperate need of him because you're not always going to live on this three-dimensional planet. So, yad heh right? Breath, four winds, what happened when Ezekiel prophesied to the four winds? First of all, God told him to prophesy. There's a valley of dry bones, as most churches. And the preachers are all like Ezekiel. They're counting corpses as though they were an army. But they're not. They've come together. Everybody's all about that. Well, we, we have this connection class, and we have that, and everybody's coming together. And look how many we've got coming, right? Look how many we've got coming. So they've forgotten about how many do you have going. So the preacher takes his picture with all the crowd of people making sure he doesn't show any empty seats. Right? He calls that an army. Except it has hands that don't feed, it has feet that can't walk, it has eyes that don't see, it has ears that don't hear. Then God says, that's pretty cool, now prophesy to yad heh And when the Spirit came upon them, 
the wind came upon them. Then they arose an exceeding great army. So take it back to that, that part of your spirit. You, you will someday have a baby in all probability. Right now there are eggs in your body at some point during your cycle because God's a God of cycles, intention, purpose, timing. If that egg does not receive the seed, it will in your cycle be cast off. So it is alive, but it's abiding in a state of death. That's how you were. You were alive, but you were abiding in death. You were separated from God. You were a stranger to God and of the commonwealth of Israel. You had no hope and you were without God in this world. But then came the sower and sowed the seed of the word of God Bible says you are born again of the incorruptible seed of the Word of God so that when that word germinates with your alive but abiding in death spirit you become not your mom I'm not my mom I'm not my dad but a new creature Say, I'm a new creature. I'm not who I was. Stop identifying with your past. You have no past. If you're born again. Now, most people don't have a future. They just have a prolonged present. I'm going to try this side over here, scoot over. I said, most people just have a prolonged present. I didn't mean to talk about you. Why are you still fighting the same devil you fought yesterday? Well, I've had these headaches for 12 years, and you usually call them your headaches. I never heard of a heavenly flu, have you? Listen to me. Yod Hey Wah Hey does not give you sickness, weakness, weariness of spirit. Your spirit has been recreated by the Word of God. Therefore, It is a word being. If you don't feed your word being word, you become emaciated. Everybody shout a minute. I'm not going to go two and a half hours like the last four of these things. Oh, everybody says go ahead and then they stay home the next week. <laughs> Where was I on here? God! Yes, sir. <laughs> this is mine. Yes, sir. <laughs> 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 it's eight after eight. you read this book, that was all in the first two sentences right there. Think about it. God has always, his entire intention, from creation through the cross to the book of Revelation, his purpose is to try, try, try. That happens every time I get in front of Miss Cerise. It's all rib rib. To try to hang out with you. The God I'm talking about. Now, it'd be enough if it was Jesus. 
But the only reason he came was to try to give a three-dimensional world a revelation of a God that was not. enough sense to say show us the father the father the father show us the father he finally said if you've seen me you've seen all you can take of the father because no man can see God and live Woo. Woo. that's that's the issue issue with the incarnation that you would set up image worship and God wants you to look through the cross through the resurrection to what you really are because you are a spirit Woo. now what ah! what is so God created right he is that spirit. So how did he create? By releasing who he was through words. I don't know why you're not screaming right now. Oh, maybe because you don't understand. Maybe you're still caught in humanistic theology. Maybe you think that a miracle is the violation of natural law. Don't ever say that. A miracle is not the violation of a natural law. Tell me what a miracle is. Thou, you got that one, didn't you? What is it? God being God. Wrong. No, it is. <laughs> That's right. It's God being God, right? He is miracle. He is miracle. And if we can ever get the hindrances out of the way of his spirit and his word, we will walk in miracle. Ah, God. Why? Because everything in the world that is was created. Did God create it? Did he or didn't he? Okay. So he created a flower. Well, how about this? How about his celestial watch? Did he create the sun? Did he do a miracle in your Bible that you can think of regarding the sun? What? What did he do? He stopped it. Because his servant was winning the battle, but all the devils weren't dead yet. So the prophet said, I need just a little more time and we'll take care of all of them. And God said, son. And the son stood still. Did he violate his own law? He's the one that created it. He's the one that set it in motion. No, he didn't violate it because he is the creator and nature that he created has to respond to his words. That's how you get cancer out of your body.
I believe I'd just stand up right now and I'd go to screaming at something that I want out of my life right now. People just said, no. I'd go to screaming about something I wanted manifested in my life right now. Scream at it. Command it to obey the word of yod heh wah So God's always wanted to hang out. I got 15 minutes. God has always wanted to hang out with you. Do you understand that? God does not shrink away from you. You do not have to conjure up God. All you have to do is get the barriers out of the way. Oh, this is so good. Are you at Romans 12? That's where I told you to go 30 minutes ago. Listen to this. Romans 12, 1. Place your life before God. Uh, all of it. Here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your every day shout every day going to work say it eating sleeping walking around life didn't say a thing about church didn't say yay i would say preach didn't say yay i would say sing didn't say anything about that Take your everyday, ordinary life. How many of you have one? Shout me. You're sleeping, eating, going to work. He can't bless that if you don't go. Going to... He didn't say go to the government line and stick out your hand. It's not what he said. Go to work, walking around life. Place it before God as... An offering. Keep going. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Did He get you up this morning? Did He set you on your way? Did He give you the job you got? Then quit complaining. Did He get you the car you've got? Because that was all the faith you had right there. But he, did, he went that far with you. Some of you look at your spouse. He does exceeding abundantly above anything you ask or think. The best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture. He's not talking about just the culture out there. He's talking about the church culture. That this is where you meet with God. That this is where you worship. That this is where you receive a word. That this is where he does miracles. That this is where you give. That Don't get adjusted to that culture. That you fit into it without even thinking. People come to church. Don't expect God to do anything. They just expect to go to church. And God help us if we don't get out at 8.30. Because we didn't come expecting anything anyway. The atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground of your miracle. Most so-called believers are not. They have very little, if anything, in front of God. They are not anticipating anything. They are not expecting anything, but maybe some high hanging fruit out there. They want to be a success. How about you make it to work on time? Oh yeah, it's getting quiet now. Because you don't think God cares anything about that. Why would God care anything about that? I'm going to prove it to you. 
Instead, fix your attention on who? Your boss, the economy, the president, people that want to be the president, the guy that cuts you off. You'll be changed how? From the inside out. Readily recognize what God wants from you and quickly respond to it. Next. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. Baby Christians. Babies. No ability to stand on their own. Fall apart at the slightest attack. Baby Christians. Not rooted. Not grounded. Don't have enough time to study God's word. Just need to be entertained long enough to soothe their conscience so they can go back out there into the culture. Hey, God, I wish. God brings the best out of you. Develops well-formed maturity in you. Say, in me. In me. I'm not going to fall apart. If the doctor says I have to die and cannot live, I'm rooted. I'm grounded. I'm not going to believe everything I see on Facebook. The whole thing's a lie to begin with. I'm rooted. I'm grounded. I'm not going to fly off the handle at my enemy, at my adversary. I'm going to love my adversary because I'm part of the church and the main part of the church is love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. All right. How many feast seasons? Three. They are. Come on, church. Come on, church. You're better taught than that. Three feast seasons. What are they? Passover. How many days after Passover? 50. Those are in the spring of the year. Then a long period of time. And then what comes in the fall of the year? Tabernacles. The actual word is Sukkot. Sukkot. It begins at the feast of Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. Three feasts in this one feast season called Tabernacles. Get it? Tabernacles. Why did God create the Tabernacle of Moses? Was that Haiti again? Was it? First one, man. Every time. Give them the answer, honey. To dwell with them. You don't know why God made the tabernacle of Moses? Okay, I better take some Wednesdays on the tabernacle. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Spirit, soul, body. Gabriel, Michael, Lucifer. Outer court, inner court, holy of holies. The reason he made the tabernacle was because man had sinned and separated himself from God. And God was trying to make before Jesus a way that he could come and dwell in the midst of his people. Again, God trying to be with you. There they are, Passover, Feast of Passover, Pesach, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruit, then Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, and there's another, another feast in there we're not talking about, Azaret, Pesach. Then you get to Tabernacles, there are three feasts. The Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, or the head of the year. It means New Year's. It means a new beginning. It means God saying to you, I'm going to wipe your slate clean. But here's the process through which you must go in order to have a brand new, new beginning. How many of you'd like a brand new beginning? How many of you'd like a mulligan? How many of you'd like a do-over? 
Well, that's what he's given you. He said the Feast of Trumpets. We know Jesus will return to the earth during, no, Jesus will return in the sky during the Feast of Tabernacles in the rapture of the church some year. Some year. That's why this time of year is very, very important. That's why there's ghouls and goblins and skeletons and ghosts and witches and warlocks and spook houses and all that kind of stuff. It's why there are more wars than any other time during the year. It's why there are more hurricanes, more tidal waves, more destruction, more death, more murders this time of year during tabernacles than any other time of the year docu documented historically because the devil knows one of two things. Jesus is coming in the rapture or if he does not, God promises that he will set at the, at the day of atonement your financial future for the rest of the year. In fact, he will set, based on what you do during the 10 days of on the Day of Atonement, he will set till next Rosh Hashanah what he's going to do for you. Why are you looking at me, friend? Head of the year. How's it begin, Feast of? It's right there. All you got to do is read it. What is it? Trumpets. Trumpets. The trump of God shall sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the rapture. Harpazo. Catching away. When does it come? How is it announced? Trumpets. Feast of trumpets. Then 10 days of awe. Then feast of atonement, at one -ment, Yom Kippur, where we celebrate, as we did last Wednesday night, the blood. <laughs> oh, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. Then you get to, that was last Wednesday. Then you enter into the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot or booths. Say booths. So there was the Tabernacle of Moses. Then there was the temple in Jerusalem. Why did he create the temple? To dwell. Say it, to dwell. To dwell among his people. Same as he did the tabernacle in the wilderness, the temple in Jerusalem. After that was destroyed in 70 AD, these feasts became all the more prominent. The Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. The Jewish people will build something called a Sukkot. It's a dwelling, it's a dwelling place. I'm about to freak you out. It's a dwelling place. Leviticus 23, 42. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. Say it again. You shall dwell in booths. A sukkah. During sukkah. If you were in Israel right now, or if you were in Bexley, right over here on the east side of Columbus, and you drove around the back of their houses, there would be sukkahs everywhere. And they will be living in them for seven days. To this day, Orthodox Jews will celebrate this feast this way. They will come out of their homes. They will live in a structure, usually behind their home. It can be, uh, I think, 20 feet high, something like that. But, you know, there are some in Jerusalem. I took those when I was over there. They're, they're, th that's what they look like inside. Leave it there. Now, 
the sukkah can be only, I, I think it's 20 feet, something like that. But there's a prescribed limit of height. How many, how many dimensions do we live in? But there is no limit on width or depth. So it can be as wide or as deep as one decides to make it. The reason for that is the roof symbolizes the cloud of day uh, uh, by day and the pillar of fire by night. It signifies God outstretched over, see the table, the everydayness of your life. What God is trying to tell you is he's not just in here. Why is there no restriction on width or depth? What did I do? Drop something? Thank you. Can you tell I was born to do this? Like I just, I just, I just love his word. There is no limitation on width or depth because what God is saying, my cloud, my fire, my presence will go as wide and as far as you will carry it. This entire feast is not about you as much as it is about God's presence. You know, we got, we got worshipers selling 10 million records. They don't even know this. They don't even know it. This feast is about presence. It's not about light shows or how you twirl your voice. It's about what's on you. It's about what's in you. It's about what comes up out of you. Pastor, I've told people for years, it has nothing to do with what I say. It has everything to do with what's on what I say. You can cast out devils with the begets if you're anointed. Or you can yell and scream to the cows come home with the flowery tongue eloquence of men and never accomplish one thing. I'm just told it is 8.30. So, time to quit. Oh, I love it when you do that. Uh, let me just try one more time. Just so when I lay down tonight, I can hear it. I just, it's time to quit. You're so kind. You're so kind. What if I told you that the feast lasts for seven days? What if I told you that during those seven days, every single day, the Jewish people are required to invite a stranger or an orphan or a widow into their sukkah every day, a different one. This thing's about spreading the kingdom. It's not about I'm just going to live in here and keep God's presence to myself. It's about why don't you bring somebody to the house? Why don't you find a hurting one, a wandering one, a wandering one? Why don't you bring the hurting, the possessed, the broken, the bruised, and bring them into your house? Now I'm not asking you to build a sukkah. But why don't you think about every now and then finding somebody that's hurting and bringing them into the house where there's healing and there's presence and there's peace. There's nothing wrong with their house that what's right in this house won't fit. 
Another thing they were required to do is every night of those seven days, they were to read the words of a patriarch. You understand what a patriarch is? Abraham, Moses, people like that. And then relate to the people that through those seven manifestations, they actually believe that the spirit of those patriarchs comes into their sukkah. And you think we're spooky. And they read those words. Would you like to know who the seven are? Come back next year doing Sukkot, and I will share them with you. No, I won't. I'm going to tell you who they are right now. The first one is Abraham. The second is Isaac. The third is Jacob. The fourth is Moses. The fifth is Aaron. The sixth is Joseph. When they bring Joseph in, they talk about spiritual foundation. The last is David, who represents sovereignty and kingship and the coming kingdom of God and of his Christ. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 16, 14, and I'm closing. And you shall rejoice in the feast, you, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant. I like this part. And the Levite, You're supposed to bring him over. That's, that would be pastor. And the stranger. And the orphan. And the widow. The Israelite sages say, the only true joy is shared joy. I wonder what would happen if even half the church this week would think about a stranger. How many have run into a stranger every now and then? Raise your hand. What if you invited them to church? What? See, he, he didn't say, he said, go into all the world. He didn't say go to church. God cares about the everydayness of your life. Joni got a hold of this revelation so strongly. I guess it's been 15, 18 years ago. She's always ahead, you know. And I walked in one day. I'd been on the road. I think I'd been out about 10 nights straight. And I got home and walked in the bedroom, put my things away, and I came back out. And she was standing at the kitchen sink. And she'd made me some spaghetti. Glory. And so there were big old pots and pans. And she's standing there, you know, and she's scrubbing away. But she's crying like a little child. Somebody showed me a video last night of a little child. Her goldfish graduated to heaven. And so her mom was over at our house and she said, look at this video I just shot. And a little girl, I don't know, she's six, seven years old. And she's standing there in front of where the little goldfish is floating on water. And she's doing one of these cries. <laughs> you ever do one of those? I mean, you know you're crying when you can't get your breath. <laughs> and I felt so bad for her. Miss Joni went out to the trunk of her car and got in the entire trunk load of toys. I'm serious, it took three bags to get them 
to that mom's car to give that little girl. So she sent us a video when she got the toys and she opened them all up and, and she said, um, I'm still sad that people die, but I sure love getting gifts. <laughs> like maybe, maybe we crossed that up a little bit. Like, the journey's standing here, she's washing those dishes. She's weeping, one of those <laughs> kind of cries. And I said, baby, I'll wash the dishes. You... She went, <laughs> no, she didn't. I, said, I wrapped my arms around her. I said, why are you crying? She said, because God said to me that his presence can be as real to me while I'm washing these dishes as when I'm on the front row of World Harvest Church in one of those high praise services because, because what I'm doing right now is my purpose. God wants to be involved in your everyday life. Quit cussing on the way to work. God's there. When you lose some air in your tire, just pull over, put the quarter in. Isn't that something they charge you for air? Put your quarter in there, fill your tire up, and thank God that you have a car. My dad used to say I used to complain about my shoes till I saw a man with no feet. What? Isn't it an amazing thing that God God, yad hey vahe, wants to come down and be involved. When you're sitting in the classroom at school, he's there. When you're walking through the mall, he's there. When you're sitting in a hunting blind, he's really there. Sometimes I take authority over nature. <laughs> You're sitting in the McDonald's line in there. Oh, God. I was there this morning. I was thinking about this message really hard. Yeah. He's there, He's here. There's nowhere you can go away from his presence. How wonderful is that?